All right, guys, uh, take a quick look at the ancient river valley civilization of ancient India, or excuse me, ancient China, my bad. And China is the last of the four river valleys. We started, you know, Mesopotamia, Egypt, people migrate over to India, and finally they get here to the Yellow River Valley civilization along the Wang Ho River. And China is in a unique location. To the north, they've got the Gobi Desert and Siberia. Um, we've got the Himalayan Mountains over here, the Tinshan Mountains down here, the jungles of Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Ocean. So China is separated by long distance and physical barriers from everybody else. It is the last of the four river valleys to settle for the simple fact that they were so far and away um, from everybody else. So they called themselves the Middle Kingdom because they literally felt like they were the center of the world. And the Yellow River, which looks like this, gets its name from this fine soil that blows off the Gobi Desert in Siberia and lands in the river. And it's very um, like chalky, kind of like powder. Like when our rivers, um, when it rains, turn orange, well, it turned yellow. And the problem is this soil called low S doesn't pack. It doesn't make good mud so we can make bricks like in Mesopotamia. So the Yellow River is also known as the River of Sorrows. Here again is a look at all the um, isolation, the Himalayas, the jungles to the southeast, the Gobi Desert. And so this isolation once again led to the Japanese belief that they were the sole center of the entire world. And so the Yellow River, as you can see here, is called the River of Sorrows. And it's here where Chinese history begins. If you live down here in the river, you can see living close to the river is great. But when it floods, as all river valleys do, it washes away all of your land and property. Think about the most expensive real estate in the world is waterfront property. Yeah, it's great, but if there's a hurricane or a flood, um, your entire civilization gets wiped out. So you got to move up here to the mountains, and man, it's really, really, really difficult. And so here is where we get um, where the dynasty, the civilization is going to take shape around 1650 BC, 1650 BC. And the legend has that there was a village official, a guy named Yu. And Yu was afraid his village was going to flood. So he goes out and he starts to dig channels, irrigation canals around his village. So when the river flooded, things would be safe. And everyone said, hey, you, what are you doing while well, I'm digging? And you digs and digs and digs for 13 years. He doesn't go home to visit his wife, doesn't go home to see his children. He just keeps on digging. And the Chinese gods looked down and said, there's our guy. That's what we want. Some guy who's going to show devotion to duty, who's going to be loyal, love hard work, and his family. So they bestow upon him the mantle of the emperorship. And the gods blessed him with the mantle of power. And Yu becomes the mythological founder of the first of 31 dynasties in ancient China, known as the Shang Dynasty. Very easy to remember the Shang. Just remember your Mulan. Her boyfriend's name was Shang. And the Shang will be, again, as I said, the first of these 31 dynasties that run throughout Chinese history. Unlike most um, civilizations, the Shang kings built palaces in many small areas. So they constantly moved around and about, keeping an eye on their people. So their people saw them and knew them. It wasn't a guy at a far off, far away palace somewhere. It's someone that they saw. Also in China, we do things a little bit differently. Um, these nobles, family members selected by the Shang emperors, are going to control bits of territory for him. They are also going to be military leaders because they're the only guys who have enough money to afford like weapons and armor and horses. If you know anything about horses, 
they are very um, expensive. Most people, however, were peasants, and no greater gap between rich and poor existed in the ancient world than between the upper class and the lower class in China. Most people were constantly farming or trying to control the flooding on Yellow River. Just like everybody else, the Chinese are deeply polytheistic. They've got many gods and goddesses, as usual, the god of the wind, the god of the rain, the god of the sun. But the Chinese add something different to it. They believe in ancestor worship, those dead departed ancestors who are closer to the ear of the Lord of heaven. Think back to your Mulan, we meet her when she's going in the family temple to pray. You could ask your ancestors to help you out to keep you safe, to make sure the crops grow, you couldn't ask for anything greedy. I describe it as the way a Roman Catholic will use a saint. You can't pray for yourself 24 hours a day, but a saint or an ancestor can. The Chinese also believe everything must be held in balance. To the ancient Chinese, heaven and earth existed on the same plane. There wasn't an earth and, and heaven. So everything had to be kept in balance, day and night, light and dark, male and female. So they come up with the yin-yang symbol. You have the white teardrop with the black dot in it, and the black teardrop and the white um, tear or dot in it. The black stands for female and the earth, like the mother earth from the dark, rich soil, all things grow. Um, yang means male. It is heaven, earth, and light. But each gender has a little bit of the other one in it to help keep things in check and in balance. Nature was a very important part of their civilization. Writing, um, the Chinese used pictograms to represent a word or an, an idea. And originally in ancient China, people spoke two languages or multiple dialects of a language, but they all wrote the same. So their writing allowed them to um, communicate. But writing was very difficult to learn as the Chinese had to memorize 10,000 different characters. And you had to write neatly because in its most simplistic sense, changing the angle of a Chinese character could turn a compliment into an insult or a positive into a negative. So you had to write extremely neatly. Eventually, Chinese writing will be known as calligraphy, and it will become an art form like you guys see on the board every day. But then we get to a thing, we get to a point in 1027. And in 1027, the next dynasty of China begins, a, called the Zhao or the Chao dynasty. And the problem with this is, if the Shang, like the Egyptian pharaohs, were viewed as living gods, how do you topple <coughs> excuse me, a living god? How do you kick a god out of power? And the Zhao Chao said, well, look, mandate of heaven, the gods gave divine right for the emperor to rule. But over time, his descendants, his great-grandchildren, his great-great-grandchildren, they forgot what it meant to be a royal. They forgot how they achieved that mantle of leadership. They didn't remember you who went out there and rolled up his sleeves and dug. They'd become greedy, spoiled children. So therefore, the gods removed that mantle, and it was time for them to take over. The Chinese and the great um, scholar Confucius will later validate this, in what we call the dynastic cycle or the mandate of heaven. And there were 31 Chinese dynasties, some lasting a lot longer than others, ranging from this time, 1650 BC, all the way till 1911, all right, just 106 um, years ago. And here is the, the dynastic cycle. At the top, the emperor will roll up his sleeves and he will repair defensive walls and he will get rid of bandits and he will quell rebellions. He will give land to the poor and he's out there working with it. And his son will do this and probably his grandson. But a little while later, when everything is working really well, all right, the 
the great-great-grandson, well, he doesn't have to do it all. He just has to maintain it. He's going to check on it every week. And then it becomes every two weeks. And then it becomes every month. And then it's like, well, I'll have somebody go check on it for me. So the farther and farther and farther you go, the less hard work the emperor does. He inherits the position. So after a while, the emperor is so greedy and selfish, he's up in his palace. He's got a new iPhone X and an Xbox One and a PlayStation 7 and Netflix and Hulu and Sling and, and DirecTV. And he's living a life of luxury. And so the defensive walls break down. The irrigation canals don't work. Food isn't being grown. Invaders come in. And he doesn't do any of those things that his ancestors started. So the gods will get disgusted. They will.